Hello and welcome to the very first episode of If Clothes Could Talk, the web series that uncovers the beautiful, the slightly strange, and the wildly fascinating world of fashion history. My name is Liv Hutley, I'm an emerging costume and production designer based in Australia who's very keen to learn about the wide world of historical garments. And I'm joined by the brilliant Ellie Gunton, who's an emerging archaeologist and a lover of all things fashion history. Hello, Ellie. Hello. So, Ellie, please tell our lovely audience what If Clothes Could Talk is all about. So, this series is focused on discussing and re-remembering fashion of gone-by eras and the people who inhabited them. So we'll be exploring the stories that clothing can tell us about society, power, politics, gender, sexuality, class, ethnicity, and much, much more. We want to talk about how fashion is a visual expression of identity, and we hope to use it as a medium with which to revisit overlooked stories from throughout human history. Exactly right, Elle. So we are so excited to go on a massive learning journey with you, our audience, into the wide and often pretty wacky world of fashion history. But before we dive right into our first episode, there are a couple of things we need to cover first. Yes, first of all, we would like to state that the intellectual properties surrounding the clothing that we discuss and the production of knowledge associated with their cultural meaning belongs to traditional groups and that we will be seeking permission before discussing or sharing information surrounding these practices. Yes, we want to stress that If Clothes Could Talk is an education platform. However, we understand that we do not own the past and have no right to share cultural information without the permission and involvement of that cultural community. And we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands, waterways and skies on which we create, the Turrbal and Yagara people in what is now called Brisbane. We pay respect to elders both past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. So let's dive right into our first episode. Ellie, what are we discovering today? Well, since it is our first ever episode, I thought we may as well start with some of the oldest archaeological samples we have of clothing and who they belong to. So we're talking about Bootsy the Iceman. So Liv, as you know, I love history and I'm often seen sporting various historical looks from the past. You do. As an archaeology student, I tend to see clothes and objects a little differently. They aren't just artifacts, they're stories. And our first topic is an example of just that. Utsi the Iceman was found in 1991 on the border of modern-day Austria and Italy in a glacier by some very startled hikers. We believe that he lived between 3100 and 3370 BCE, so he's around 5000 years old. Originally, the local police believed the body to be recent because of the amazing level of preservation. However, he is ancient. What I particularly love about Utsi is that he had lots of his clothes with him, which makes him the perfect jumping off point for this series. So, what clothes did he have on him at the time? Okay, so due to the unorthodox way Utsi was recovered, as well as his age, a lot of the detailing in his clothing has been lost. Nevertheless, archaeologists did manage to recover quite a bit of what he was wearing. These garments include a hide coat, a grass cape, some leggings, a loincloth, a belt, some shoes, and a bearskin cap. Okay, so bearskin, grass, hide, what do all these materials actually tell us about Utsi? So Liv, a very groovy study published in 2016 looked at the animal hides used to make Utsi's clothing. Targeted enrichment and sequencing of the full mitochondrial genomes in the shoelace, hat, loincloth, coat, leggings and quiver samples revealed very promising and fairly conclusive evidence. These sequences were compared to reference samples and it was concluded that the quiver was made of roo deer, the coat, sample two, and the leggings were made of goat, the shoelace was made of cattle, the loincloth, dark coat, light coat, and coat sample one were made of sheep, and the hat was made of bear fur. It even notes that the materials derived from sheep and goat came from multiple individuals. There were at least four sheep and two goats used in the manufacture. A whole four. <laughs> so that study was particularly cool because it provided us information relating to how clothes were manufactured and might imply a certain aspect of wear and tear that the clothing endured. So it appears that the clothing was either made from multiple hides or the wear on the clothing was so extreme that it had to be repaired super frequently. It was also noted in that study that not all the animals were domesticated breeds, and some animals had undomesticated DNA. 
So Elle, I didn't quite understand why it was important that some were domesticated and some weren't. What does this actually tell us? So using DNA references, the cattle, the sheep and the goat sequences could be identified in modern European domestic animals and the roe deer and bear from wild species in the Alpine region. So this provides further evidence that Utsi did a mixture of hunting and domestic herding. Mm. The investigation noted that the data did not indicate any cross-contamination, which would have told us that fats and oils coming from other animals could have been involved in the tanning process. So, we believe that the clothing was not tanned in a way that we traditionally understand it, so there's more to investigate there for archaeologists. What Utsi's clothes can tell us is about his own personal patterns, but it can also provide wider implications around hunting, domestication of animals, and larger clothing practices at the time. Ah, so we can really tell an incredible amount about the wider communities that Utsi may have been a part of at the time? Exactly! Utsi represents a larger clothing production in his local community. Every community would have had a variation on a similar style to their neighbours. Think about how different fashion would have been across the globe at that point in time. While today we may see small variations of a larger fashion trend globally, these communities could be so isolated that their own ideas of fashion and social presentation could be completely different to the other side of the world. There was no normal. So while Utsi could possibly represent his community style, that is if he wasn't a social outcast or trendsetter, we can't draw conclusions about his choice of animal fur, the construction of clothes, or even individual pieces. We can't assume anything in the archaeological practice, and if there is one golden rule I want to impress upon our viewers, it is that every person, alive and dead, has their own style and their own autonomy. That's so true. Okay, so now that we know a little more about Utsi and why his clothing is just so crucial to the study of the time that he lived in, let's deep dive a little further. So Ellie and I have been lucky enough to work with the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in putting this episode together, and today we'll be joined by a Zoom by Andreas Putzer. So Andreas is the conservator and the curator of the museum which currently holds Utzi's body, and they're the leading researchers on the topic. So we'd like to welcome Andreas all the way from Italy. Hi! Yes, I'm uh, Andreas Putza. I work for the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology that is located here at uh, Bolzano, a small city in the north of Italy. And um, I'm uh, responsible for the conservation of the objects of uh, Ötzi, the Iceman, uh, his weapons and his clothes. And uh, I have also other jobs to do for the museum. For example, I'm often the curator of our special exhibitions. Actually, we are still organizing a special exhibition about mobility during the period in which the Iceman uh, or Utsi lived. Awesome! That's oh, such a cool job! <laughs> such a cool job! So what can Utsi's clothes sort of tell us about the environment that he lived in? See, the clothes of Utsi were uh, very functional. Uh, he was found on a mountain, so the clothes is uh, made to uh, stay in the mountain. They are warm, but at the same time also uh, very functional. Then we know that he used uh, domestic animals, so he must uh, be part of a, a farmer community. Uh, so we found also some cereals on his clothes, so we know that he lived together in, or he lived in a farmer community. People from the bottom of the valleys went up during the summertime to hunt, to bring their domestic animals, but also to cross the Alps uh, and to trade. So also uh, Utsi was crossing the Alps, he was found on a pass on 3,200 meters, and he was walking from south to north. So what we are trying to understand is uh, why and how people use this high alpine environment uh, during the summer. Yeah, awesome. So how much of what Utsi was wearing was for necessity versus do you think there was implications of fashion at the time of any kind or style or personal adornment? Uh, the problem is that the uh, finds or the clothes of Utsi are unique. So 
we don't uh, we have no comparison we don't can co we cannot compare these clothes with clothes from other areas of Europe in the meantime there is a find from Switzerland of leggings and the leggings have the same cut as the leggings of the Iceman so maybe uh, this is the fashion of pants or of, of male pants in this period we don't know it exactly we archaeology needs uh, other finds to compare and to, to understand also if there is a fashion or if there is a cultural contact. Amazing. So in constructing those clothes, do you, do we have any idea of how they would have been constructed? Once they had the hides, what then would they do with them? Is there like hand sewing? Um, yeah, what sort of processes do you think happened? Yes, uh, so if you uh, want to make clothes from hides, you have to, to treat them. So, um, uh, you have to to clean them from uh, from the meat that parts remain on on the head, and then you have to dry them. Uh, normally, they dry um, the hides uh, with fire using um, leaves, because the leaves uh, contain, uh, for example, aldehyde and ketone acid, and uh, these uh, substances substances are antibacterial. Uh, the problem is that uh, through dry, uh, drying, the leather becomes hard, and so you need after the, to treat the hides with fat. Uh, normally, they use the animal fat uh, from domestic animals, also from wild animals, but for example, you can use also milk or butter. We don't know exactly uh, what uh, the Iceman or Itzy used uh, because uh, it's, it wasn't possible uh, to analyze it. So today it's not possible, but the research on the Iceman is so interesting because it's uh, going on all these years and we hope, and also research is evolving and so we hope that in future there are methodologies and we are able to analyze also this uh, aspect. Awesome. That's very cool. Very, very cool. So what are your hopes for where the Utsi research will go now? What are you trying to discover next? Actually, we, uh, we make a bit of research. My colleague is making a research on uh, the copper X, on the blade of the copper X found together with the Iceman. Uh, we made a few years some analysis and we discovered that the copper used to make this blade came from Tuscany. That's far away from uh, Salzburg or from the fine, fine side of uh, the Iceman and uh, about 500 or 600 kilometers and uh, now we are still analyzing other copper uh, objects of this period in northern Italy and also in the north of the Alps to, to understand if there was a trade uh, 5,000 years ago of these copper plates in this area. So maybe today we have, we imagine that this, uh, uh, these people were not uh, mobile but they uh, the raw materials show that uh, the cultural groups were in contact with each other and they trafficked a lot of uh, stuff or, or probably also animals or, or leather clothes or wow amazing research really really cool Ellie, do you have any more I questions do. You I do. Do. of course you do um i study archaeology so i'm an emerging archaeologist, as we like to say, um, and I have I had to do an assignment on Utsi. I think it was last year, and it I found out that it is not concluded how he died. There's a lot of speculation on what happened. What do you think happened to Utsi? Yes, it's a mystery. Is that is a mystery? You know, we know in the meantime that he was killed. So, 2001 was found an arrow head in his uh, left shoulder, and this arrow had damaged the arteria subclavia, and probably he uh, died losing uh, the blood and very fast. Probably he was killed there where he was found, but we obviously don't know the reason. Uh, the reason why he was killed up there, 
maybe he escaped uh, from uh, fightings and uh, then uh, he was uh, he would he escaped uh, on the Alps on, on the mountain and then he was killed there so that, that's a big mystery I don't think that we will solve it in the next years or uh, but we will see <laughs> so you think he was killed on the mountain because I've read that there's some theories it was a burial during and, yeah there are some colleagues that uh, think that the iceman was killed somewhere else and then he was brought up the mountain and offered to the gods mm -hmm. but uh, there's nothing that proved this uh, uh, this theory we i think that he was killed up there where he was found because he was uh, lying he was sitting or lying in this in a place and this place was used before and also after it. It seems that the place where he was found is a place to stop when you are on the bottom of the mountain, just to sit a little bit, to drink some water, to eat something, and then you uh, can go on. Because there are finds that are older or younger than the Iceman. So the Iceman was not the only human uh, stopping there. Wow. Yeah, cool. I had no idea. Very groovy. Uh, well, is that all the questions you have? I think so. Andreas? Thank you so much thank for you. joining us. It has been such a pleasure and thank you to the museum for helping us out with this episode. Um, the resources on your website are incredible. Uh, for somebody who doesn't come from an archaeology background, I come from a costume background. And so it's really great to have accessible education like that available in so many different languages as well, which is yeah. wonderful. So um, yes, we, we try always uh, the best. So also the exhibition is very simple, available for everybody, also for children. So now we are still waiting for a new museum. We hope to have a new museum in a few years, a bigger museum, because we have a lot of visitors and maybe you have the possibility to come to Bolzano to see the ice planet with uh, his clothes. So it's a uh, wonderful work that your museum is doing and you, of course. So thank you so much. And uh, we oh, hope to you. talk to you soon. And uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andreas. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well, everyone, that is all we have time for in this episode. We hope you learned a thing or two about Utsi and the amazing archaeological research being done in, on his clothes and around these topics. But this episode couldn't have been possible without these amazing people. We can't wait to talk to you on our next episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram. We are at If Clothes Could Talk AUS. And if you have a question or a couple of suggestions, you can email us at If Clothes Could Talk AUS at gmail.com. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button to get notified when our next episode comes out. Until next time, bye! bye. Do it again! <laughs> I just shut my eyes immediately. I'm like, if I can't see it, it still it, takes it seven. Can't